but we want to welcome you to our final installment of the Ten Commandments of Marriage. This has been seven weeks we've been talking about marriage. We hope you've caught all of it or at least most of it. And uh, sweetheart, do you think today's is going to be good? I think so. It, anytime you study on marriage, it's always helpful. And I was just thinking too, you know, when, when we work at our marriage, it just sets a, uh, an example, like a role model for our kids. Um, it just makes it easier for them. It's so much easier in life when you have someone setting an example before you that you can uh, follow after or copy. So it, it really does pay off, even into the next generations. Good. So, hey, sow into your own life, sow into the life of the coming generations, and let's find out a little bit about marriage. Um, the next verse is a real important one, especially taken in the context. In verse 15 of chapter 2, it says, Catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Any, ever, any of you ever hear the phrase, you know, little foxes spoil the vine? Right, that's from the scripture, obviously. And uh, he's talking about the context of marriage in Psalm 128 and verse 3, it says, Your wife will be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. And that is the context here. And the only way we're going to catch the little foxes is to, to come out from behind a wall and have some honest, heart-to-heart, face-to-face communication. And it's generally not the big things. I mean, it can be, but a lot of times it's not the big things that destroy a marriage. It's the little things that are never taken care of. Little thing piled upon little thing. Little thing not taken care of that grows into bitterness and resentment. And you know, what would happen in the vineyards, the larger fox would come in, be able to jump up and get the grapes, but the little foxes couldn't reach the grapes hanging up higher on the vine. So what the little foxes would do when they'd get into the vineyard is they would chew the bottom of the grapevine and cause the grape plants to fall over, and then they would get the grapes. Where a larger fox wouldn't destroy the vine, the little fox would destroy the vine. And it is true in a marriage. Sometimes it is just those little things that are not dealt with, the areas of our life that, that the inconsistencies, the things that we just kind of gloss over and, and don't change. They, they can eat away, you know, at a, at a marriage relationship. And Jan and I, I know I, I asked you to think of a, a couple of little foxes that you might want to mention. Don't tell them about my foxes, okay? Just, just, just general foxes. General ones. I, I remember one time when, well, actually a few times, but when we were, uh, the kids were, the kids were really young, and we we're done with dinner, and there's all the dinner dishes to clean up, and the kids need a bath to get to bed, and different things, and, and I'm thinking, I'm cleaning up the kitchen, and I'm thinking, gosh. Why doesn't he get the kids ready for bed? He's just sitting there watching TV. And um, I know none of you have ever been there before. And so... It never occurred to me. Sorry. Uh, wait, I'm telling you. Okay. So I'm thinking, I mean, you know, you can start just... It's irritating you. Well, gee, can't he just see, you know, let's... You, you want to get to bed at a reasonable time. Just, and... Uh, can you just help? Well, you could start slamming covered doors and making a little noise. Maybe he'll get the idea that you need some attention. But then one night, I just thought to myself, you know what? I'm just going to ask him. So I just asked him, you know what? Could, could you help get, maybe you could give Rebecca, help Rebecca and Spencer get their baths you know, while I clean up the kitchen? And he goes, sure, no problem. He never thought of it. Mm. <laughs> never occurred to me. You see, the thing, for me, as women, we are made to help. We're wired up to help. How can I help you? What can I do? Men are wired up to lead and not really thinking about the details, but the overall. Just, we'll all get to bed tonight, you know. <laughs> and so, to me, it would be a normal thing to think, how can I help you? But they're wired just a little bit different, so just ask and see. I don't know what response you'll get. But. I still don't see what the problem was. I mean, you got a, a, a three-year-old and one-year-old twins. What? <laughs> yeah. those, those things like that can be a, a little fox. Watching too much TV can be a little fox. And so 
again, the little foxes spoil the vine, and the idea is if you don't deal with those little things and talk about them, they can grow into resentments. Even if it's something that maybe once you talk it out, you think, yeah, yeah, that was stupid for me to be upset about that. But in, in, until you communicate about it, uh, you can end up giving the devil ground in a really foolish area that can erupt into something much bigger than it ever, ever should have been. So it's important to learn to talk to those thing, talk about those things uh, together. And uh, for the next few minutes, we don't, don't have a lot of time. Um, it actually gets into the sexual relationship itself in the book here, and it begins to explore intimacy in marriage. And if you look in chapter 4, it's, it's really a trip. Because it starts with speaking words. And I know Janet has, has shared a fair bit about that. But he says, behold, you're fair, my love. Behold, you're fair. You've, and, and by the way, these actually were compliments in the day. Uh, you have dove's eyes behind your veil. Your hair's like a flock of goats <laughs> going down from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep. Um, I guess in an agrarian society in that day, that was a great compliment. Um, which have come up from the washing. Everyone bears twins, none's barren among them. Your lips are like a strand of scarlet. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built for an armory on which hang a thousand bucklers, all shield of mighty men. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, which feed among the lilies. Go, goes on and on. It, um, until the day breaks, the shadows flee away. I'll go to the mountain of myrrh, the hill of frankincense. You're all fair, my love. And there's no spot in you. You know, in Ephesians, it says that husbands, you to love your wives like Christ loved the church, gave himself for her. And one of the things that Jesus does to the church, he washes her with the water of the word so that she's without spot, without wrinkle. And here's the same idea. He's speaking these words to her. And this is actually the, the prelude to them getting involved in the physical, you know, aspect of, of their marriage relationship, of, of the act of, of sexual love. It begins by speaking these love words. He's caressing her with words. He's speaking love words to her. And I think few men realize how important this aspect of love making is. Um, the guys, they get, um, you know, uh, <laughs> excited by the sight of their wife in the shower, and that's all it takes. But the girls are different, and a lot of it has to do with words. Would you agree with that, love? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. For us, just the relationship is so much more important. And it's like, I mean, for the guys, it's more the physical part. But for us, the relationship, because I don't know, just thinking, you know what, I just want to make sure we're good and make sure everything's okay and, and um, that he's just, he just doesn't want me for my body. He wants me for me. And so it takes a little time to... Yep. Well, it does. Actually, it, it involves all three parts of us. Uh, sex isn't just physical, wasn't meant to be, wasn't designed to be by God. The physical part is awesome. But if you take out the soulish and the spirit part, and if a woman doesn't feel like she's being loved and appreciated and valued, then she does just feel used. And, and the words are so important. And you know what? For, for a, a guy, it takes about that long for him to be roused and to be ready. For the woman, you got to start speaking words early, usually around breakfast time. <laughs> That's good. I mean, stuff like, I'm glad I married you, you're beautiful, I love you, and, you know, all right, she knows what you're up to, it's around breakfast, but get good at it. <laughs> Words works. are powerful. Um, goes on from here in, in this fourth chapter, there's much more romance, you know, she's got perfume on, um, there's a whole lot of kissing and touching and caressing going on, I wish we had time to get into the verses, the... The, the picture language is beautiful. There's a whole lot of foreplay involved. And, and there's something important here in verse 6. It says, until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I'll go my way to the mountain of myrrh, to the hill of frankincense, until the day breaks. In other words, the guy's not in a hurry. He's not rushing things. And men, if I could encourage you in any way with your wives, take your time. Especially when it comes to, to making love and having sex. Romance her. Love her. Speak to her. Caress her. Take time and communicate with her. It is so important. And the whole, the whole idea of this thing, you just get this flavor from reading the book, is that it's not this, this hurried thing, though sometimes you don't have a lot of time, communicate, hurried's okay. 
<laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's better when you don't have to hurry. And then just a couple of things in our remaining time. In verse 12, speaking about the, the man speaking about his wife and the sexual relationship, he says, a garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. A spring shut up, a fountain sealed. It's a garden or a spring that's enclosed and sealed. Literally means it is locked, it is barred. Not closing him out, but inviting him in to partake of that which no other can enjoy. Affection, romance, and intimate physical relationship. Everyone else is excluded except her husband. It's a locked gate to everyone else. And with talking about this relationship in this picture language, I just want you to see the next couple of verses. Verse 13, your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits. Fragrant henna with spikenard, spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all the chief spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. The idea is this, and he's, he is talking about sex and romance here. It should be enriching and refreshing and inviting and fulfilling and intoxicating. It should never be a chore or a duty. Ladies, listen. Your man, your husband, doesn't want to feel like you're just doing your duty. You know, that you're just servicing him. Listen, it, it takes you know, not all the joy, but most of the joy out of having sex if you are not engaged and if you're not, not involved in it. If, it. if it is just like, okay, you know, she's doing a duty. I hate this, but I have to do this. It's my, my marital obligation. It's, it's not what we want. It's just not. And it's, of course, that's not what any wife wants either. It should be. It talks about, you know, this fragrance and the streams and it, 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 is, it should be refreshing and inviting and, and looked forward to. And so, husbands and wives, we both need to be very engaged in this. And then in chapter five, and we're Before gonna bring this to a that. close here. And just like he said, just for us girls, to really put ourselves into it and give ourselves to it and to put energy into it. And I just wanna say, you know what, sometimes, I mean, they have so much energy and they're strong, and sometimes we can just like get worn out kind of fast. <laughs> but I'll just encourage you, if, if that's the case, do some workout, do exercises, get yourself in shape because it will pay off. You will enjoy it a whole lot more and you won't wear out as fast. Yeah. But I, it's true. It's, and I hey, think they like it better It's worth investing too. in. It's worth investing in. Get yourself a personal Ooh. trainer and go to the gym, baby. Just thought I'd throw that in Okay, there. you threw it in. I didn't, I didn't expect that. <laughs> Um, he uses this analogy again, chapter 5, verse 1. I've come to my garden, my sister, my spouse. I've gathered my myrrh with my spice. I've eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I've drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O oh friends. Drink, yes, drink deeply, O oh beloved ones. He's come into his garden and enjoyed, and now he's encouraging his friends to do, do the same in their gardens. Not in his garden, <laughs> but in their own gardens. Notice what he says here. He says, I've come to my garden. Um, Janet, does that bring to mind anything in the New Testament at all when he says, come into my garden? Yeah, well, in 1 Corinthians 7, it, I'll just turn to this real quick. It says, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 3 to 5, it says, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her and likewise also the wife to her husband. And then it goes on and says, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. So really, when we got married, we're one, and we belong to each other. Yeah. And so we can't just say, you don't, you know, I mean, once in a while, you're just too tired. But I mean, it's like, <laughs> we... Go ahead, I'm listening. You're mine and I'm his, so we have a little say with each other. And then verse 5, it says, Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. In other words, just not to deprive one another. Just be sensitive to one another's needs. And, you know, it just, like we looked in there, it should bring refreshing. It should bring release. And it's good, you know, sometimes it just... Things can be tense and, and you're busy at work and all those kind of things. And it just is 
great to just be there for one another because it's yeah. a great release and something that God intended for us to be able to have share yeah. together. You know, God created sex. It is awesome. Put it within the context of marriage. Um, it's, I reckon, honestly, uh, making love to your wife is as holy as preaching or praying before God. No shame involved in it. It's a good thing. And we ought to be able to talk about it and communicate about it. Maybe you've come from a background where that was like, hush, hush, no, no, you never talked about it, you know, in your home and came into the marriage not, not feeling comfortable talking about it. It's an important thing to talk about. And uh, I, I think it will just look, and this, we're talking about the physical relationship, to, to satisfy one another's needs. You know, you make it your goal to meet their needs. Um, whatever a man sows, whatever a woman sows, that shall they also reap. It comes back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. If you tend to them, it just, it just does get multiplied back to you. And, uh, you know, maybe wife is, is more interested in sex than the husband is. Maybe the husband's more interested than, than the wife is. Endeavor to meet one another's needs. I was doing a minister's conference in Europe um, last year, and uh, they... Uh, there's a whole bunch of ministers there, and it was a question and answer time. And one of the people asked an interesting question, that if it was okay, you know, to make love to your spouse, to have sex before you got up and preached. I'd never heard a question like that before. <laughs> and so one of the other guys is kind of given an elaborate answer, and I just said, well, you know, I think it's great. That's why we have seven services on the weekend. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I was teasing with them, of course, but, but the point is, endeavor to meet, you know, your spouse's need. And, and let, let me just bring this to a, a close, if I can. Um, back in chapter 4, verse 16, right in the midst of talking about, you know, romance and hugging and kissing and making love and, and you know, caressing one another with words and this whole thing about marriage, it said in verse 16, Awake, O north wind, and come, O south, and blow upon my garden, that its spices may flow out. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its pleasant, pleasant fruits. Now, this is the Shulamite speaking. And you know, there, there's a great analogy here. This wind that she's talking about is the influence and the presence of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit can make you desirable and attractable and attractive to your spouse. And I know there's some folks in here, your marriage is in trouble. And physical relationship, it's not everything you'd like it to be. God can help you. His wind can blow. And the point is, we need God's influence in our marriage as much as anywhere else yeah. to make it richer and fuller and more exciting you know, than it is right now. And our marriages can grow and they can get repaired if they're damaged or if they're broken. You know, God can do it. And we want the wind of God's Spirit, you know, to blow in our church services, don't we? We want the wind of God's Spirit to blow in our preaching and we want the wind of His Spirit to blow in our prophesying. What about in our marriage? What about in the sexual relationship? God can work in our marriages. And let's just trust, you know, the Spirit of God. God wants to get involved in every area of our life. And he wants to get involved in this area too. We just want to take a moment. We want to pray for marriages here. So if you've got your husband or wife with you, just grab hands. Uh, if it's not your husband or wife next to you, don't grab their hand right now. <laughs> God, we just pray. Thank you, God. We know that you influence preaching and your spirit blows. Jesus, you even talked about when a person is converted and born again, that it's the result of the spirit moving. You said the wind blows where it wills. We hear the sound of it. We see its results. We don't know where it comes from. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit. Yes. The wind of God blows into their life and opens their eyes and brings your influence and causes them to realize that you're real, Jesus. Yes. And Lord, we, we invite, we say, along with this Shulamite girl, come, wind of the Holy Spirit, into yes. our marriages. Yes. Blow and influence. Yes. Help repair that which is damaged. Yes, Father. Help restore that which has been lost. If, yes. if integrity has been, been broken, if there's been great breaches yes, Father. made in the marriages, Lord, we invite you to come. Help us to forgive. Yes. Help us to, to come out from behind 
the walls that we've erected and retreated behind. Yes, Father. Holy Spirit, come even now into this service and do a work in people's hearts. Yes. Resurrect dead love. Yes. Restore, revive, rejuvenate, refresh, oh God. Yes, Father. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Things can change. Thank you, Father. Things can grow. Things can become fruitful. And Lord, we trust you. We're certainly going to do our part. We're going to be practical, but we're also going to be spiritual, and we're going to trust you to do what we can't do. Yes. Because, Lord, we come into this relationship called marriage as very complex beings, and we see things through our own spectacles of our past uh, experiences, and the things that have happened to us, and the things that haven't happened to us, and we have sometimes false expectations. But we ask you to come, God. Yes, Father. We ask you to move, oh God. Yes. In the precious name of Jesus. And Lord, we pray for those that are here that, that have been so battered and broken and they may be divorced today or widowed. And Lord, we thank you that your word says that our maker is our husband, our maker is our spouse, and you can fill up that yes. deficit in our lives. Yes. You can be what we need you to be, Lord. And I thank you for ministering to those. And yes. Lord, for those that are single right now, I pray that you'd help them to stay pure. Yes. And help them to, to wait and to not just get entangled emotionally and get involved in, in an unhealthy relationship. Lord, we look to you for guidance. We look for you for, to, to you for sustaining power. Bless every marriage. Bless every person here. Bless every individual here, oh God. Young and old. In Jesus' name. Father, for every marriage... Everyone represented here tonight, Father, we just thank you. Thank you for your revelation. Thank you for your touch. Thank you for taking us to a greater place in yes, our marriages, God. each and every one of us. If it's good, if it's not so good, Father, each and every one of us, we look to you, Father, tonight. Move in our hearts. Jesus. Show us, Father, things we need to know, things we that will help us, Father, to make it even richer because we know you've got so much more, Father. You are an infinite, you're an infinite God and there's more and more richness and more fullness in our marriage relationships. We call upon you and we trust you, Father, yes, each and every one of us. Father, we thank you for a fuller, richer marriage relationship in Jesus' name. Amen. Please, every head bowed, every eye closed just for a moment. I mentioned a moment ago, those verses from John chapter 3, Nicodemus came to Jesus, and Jesus said, you have to be born again. He didn't understand. He said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he go into his mother's womb a second time and be born? And Jesus said, no, Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. In other words, that which is born of the Holy Spirit is the human spirit. Friend, you are a spirit being. And the Bible says we've been separated from God because of sin. A rebirth is necessary for you to be connected with God. And literally, when a person accepts Christ... The Holy Spirit comes in and changes them inwardly. So radical of a change, the Apostle Paul called it becoming a new creation in Christ. The spiritual part of you is not just influenced, but is changed by the power of God's Spirit when you embrace God's Son, Jesus. And Jesus said this influence of the Holy Spirit that comes is like the wind, even as we just prayed for that influence and the wind of the Spirit to blow in our marriages. Friend, His influence can blow into your life right now and change you. He can blow the sin out of your life and make you clean and pure and bring you into a relationship with a God who's loved you and who's known you and who's wanted to have a relationship with you. We want to lead you in a simple prayer tonight. Maybe you're not interested in a bunch of religious ritual and ceremony, neither are we. But you may be hungry to know God. Friend, God wants you to know Him. He wants you to walk with Him and talk with Him. And that's why Jesus came. He paid for our sins on the cross. After that debt was paid, Christ was raised from the dead. And the Bible says, if you believe it in your heart, confessing with your mouth is Lord, you'll be saved. As I look across this auditorium right now, anybody say, I want in. I'm away from God. I'm a backslider. Or I've never asked Christ into my life. I'm going to pray when we all pray together. And I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. But I want you to just lift a hand right now. Don't hesitate. Just throw that hand up. By that uplifted hand, know that you're in. You want to be in this prayer. God bless you. Hand there, hand there. Others in the house. Another hand right there. Fantastic. Others in there. See that? Thank you. Another hand here. Thank you. One, two, three in that section. God bless you. Four. Another one there. 
Yeah, I see that hand there. Thanks. All right, let's pray. Just pray it after me if you would. We have heaven's attention. Just be sincere. Say, oh God. Oh God. I come before you right now. Come before you right now. And I humble my heart. And I humble my heart. And I want to say thank you for giving your son. And I want to say thank you for giving your son. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, I appreciate you going to the cross. Jesus, I appreciate you going to the cross. I believe you paid for all of my sin. I believe you paid for all of my sin. And for the sins of the whole world. And for the sins of the whole world. I believe you were raised from the dead. I believe you were raised from the dead. Jesus, I ask you into my life. Jesus, I ask you into my life. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. In your precious name I pray. In your precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. Um. Thank you, thank you. Well, I hope you have been able to join us for all of or at least most of this series on marriage that we have been doing. Uh, it's been rich, and if you apply it, it'll work for you. And I, I just wanted to, to ask, if, if the broadcasts have been a blessing to you, why don't you consider sending a gift and helping us uh, to continue broadcasting in your city and in your region? This is a partnership, and we can only do what we do because of faithful partners, hopefully like you. So if you've never done it, pray about it. Please become a part of us bringing the gospel and the good news of God's word to the world. We love you. See you again. What does it take to have a great marriage? How can you weather those challenging times? Keep the fires of romance glowing. And fulfill your dreams of a lifetime of joy together. The fact is good marriages have to be worked at. A good marriage has to be built on more than passion. So how do you begin to build a great marriage? Where can you start? With Bayless Conley series, Godly Wisdom for a Great Marriage. And you know what, if I'm in right relationship with God, and if I'm full of His Word, which is His wisdom, and I'm full of His Spirit, I have a reverence for God, it's gonna affect how I treat this woman and how I relate to this woman, and God's gonna deal with me about that because marriage is his idea. Use the information on the screen to order your copy of this powerful, life-changing series by Bayless and Janet Conley. Godly Wisdom for a Great Marriage includes three CDs or DVDs that will help you build a truly great marriage. Also, this series has a fourth bonus disc, The Role of the Husband and the Role of the Wife. If you are newly married or have 50 years together, this series can give you the power and commitment to live each day closer to God and each other. And when you contact us through the information on the screen, remember that your gift makes it possible for the Answers broadcast to continue bringing our living Jesus to a dying world.